thank you for coming. Our guest today is Brian Miller, who serves as Special Assistant and Senior Counsel to President Donald Trump. He's had a very distinguished career uh, in private practice and government service. He's been Inspector General of the United States General Services Administration, Senior Appointments in the Department of Justice, uh, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics named Brian one of, quote, those who dared 30 officials who stood up for our country, end quote. And he's done all this after going to Temple University on a wrestling scholarship, then going to Westminster Theological Seminary, graduating from there, and then on to the University of Texas School of Law. So please join me in welcoming Brian here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm here in my personal capacity, not my official capacity, so I'm here uh, as an individual, not as an official. Exactly. Um, well, then, in your, in your capacity as an official uh, and as an individual, uh, tell us about uh, the General Services Administration, just a, a basic definition of uh, what does an inspector general do all day? What is the General Services Administration? <laughs> well, uh, very good questions, Marvin. Um, the uh, General Services Administration is a ag federal agency. It's probably one of the largest federal agencies that you've never heard of uh, because it works behind the scene. It uh, handles federal property. It's the federal landlord. It also uh, buys things for the federal government. So it's a procurement agency. It's the uh, premier civilian procurement agency for the federal government. It buys uh, items uh, for the federal government. It runs the uh, fleet of cars, vehicles for federal um, agencies. So if a federal official wants to drive somewhere, it's usually in a car leased by the General Services Administration. An inspector general is uh, uh, someone who uh, is charged with rooting out fraud, waste, and abuse in federal programs and charged to make these programs more efficient, effective, and, um, um, and um, uh, effective um, throughout the agency that it's uh, an inspector general is in. There are 73 inspectors general, uh, one for each agency. Many of them are Senate confirmed. I was confirmed by the Senate in 2005, appointed by President Bush. And um, they have uh, offices of auditors and uh, special agents, um, investigators, and they also have um, uh, individuals who conduct inspections and evaluations to, d to find fraud, waste, and abuse in federal programs. So as an inspector general, I mean, you obviously are there, you are an official, but in some ways, is it important to think as a, as a private citizen when you look at something, spending going on, and, and you start thinking, no, wait a minute, that's my money as a taxpayer. It's being used in this lavish way, perhaps, and that's wrong. Is that the... Is that the frame of mind that's important to get into? Not a, not a defendant of government, but in a sense a representative of private citizens? Yes, uh, precisely. Um, and in fact, if other officials get tired of hearing inspectors general talk about taxpayer dollars because inspectors general are always looking at how are these taxpayer dollars, these, um, the money that belongs to citizens, being used by the federal government? Are they being used in a, in a productive way? Or are they being used in a wasteful way? And the inspector general's job and the job of the office of inspector general is to find out how are these dollars being used? Is this program effective, uh, efficient, or is uh, this program a waste? So inspector generals, for the most part, don't get a lot of publicity. But on one particular occasion, because of one particular inspection that you did, you got a lot of publicity. Maybe you could tell us the context of that, and we'll get into this right. fascinating and sometimes very funny story. I, I used to say that inspector, I used to say that my goal was anonymity, but I, I failed miserably at that uh -huh. uh, uh, with this investigation. Uh, so uh, yes, I think inspectors general and the work they do should lar largely be without publicity, um, except to the extent that publicity can deter others. So many times we'll do investigations of people engaged in misconduct, and we want to deter others from engaging in, in misconduct, so we will uh, make a press release. 
but generally uh, an inspector general should not be running towards the cameras, you know, if, if they are, something's wrong somewhere. But one time, you did not go running towards the cameras, but the cameras came running towards you. Indeed. We, ha we declined all sorts of comments and interviews and all that. It was, um, we, we investigated a conference that the General Services Administration had in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, they spent uh, millions of dollars on the conference. Uh, the conference had very little value to it other than to um, be an opportunity for GSA officials to gather and, um, I guess, team build and um, encourage one another. They had a, um, uh, for example, they, they had a uh, contest as to who was, who had a lot of talent. And, and so they had GSA officials on GSA government time doing videotapes uh, and, uh, and songs. And so the, the song that won was uh, a song that bragged about never being under OIG investigation. <laughs> and, and the irony was, w they were under OIG investigation. They just didn't know it. Uh, but that won first place. And uh, they. America's they, Got Talent. Basically. Yes, America's Got Talent. They won first place, and then they kidded about, uh, uh, you know, um, not being subject to uh, the, the uh, pay caps and the, the bonus caps uh, and all sorts of things. And it was. Um, a very interesting time, but overall the conference, uh, you know, to give you an ex example of how wasteful it was, uh, they had eight visits out to Las Vegas to determine which hotel to have the conference at. Eight visits. Eight visits. So they, they stayed at every, you know, big resort in Las Vegas on separate occasions uh, to determine whether this hotel had the best rooms, to determine, you know, um, what the food was like and that sort of thing. And they finally uh, decided on a certain uh, resort. I won't say the name because, you know, they were just in business. And, and they spent millions of dollars on the hotel. They um, also, uh, during the conference, they would have parties at night. They, they managed to get uh, two-story two loft suites to stay in, and they kept one of the two-story loft suites as a party room. And they would have uh, parties in that room, and you could come by invitation only. And they ordered room service at room service prices mm -hmm. um, to feed the guests, all at taxpayer expense. One of the dinners was over $100 each. Um, it was very lavish. Uh, they had uh, a mind reader perform, and. Um, clowns and various other things and so we investigated that and the organizers of that conference and that um, uh, captured the imagination of the media and the Congress I testified six times in two weeks about the conference so as I look at the records of this there were this was four days there were 300 government employees there yes. so according to the uh, official amount of meal and incidental expenses that were possible, the maximum they should have spent if they were, um, you know, tr enjoying things but not in a, in a hugely lavish way, the maximum of 300 employees would be about $21,000. And their actual food total was $146,000. Just for the food. Just for the food. Just yes. for the food. Um, there was uh, $7,000 in sushi. There was a $19 per person American artisan, artisan cheese display. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you spend that much on a cheese display? What? I don't know. So, but you, you looked into all this. $3,200 on the session with a mind reader. Yes. So they had minds to waste. <laughs> Indeed. So, Indeed. okay. And then uh, uh, $400 for rented tuxedos. Uh, Yes, the, and w when they had the award ceremony, uh -huh. they rented tuxedos for the people giving the awards and receiving the and the, awards. And the recipients. Um, so I, I'm kind of disappointed, Marvin. I, I don't have a tuxedo here. You know, this is just a small operation. Um, $75,000 for the team building exercise, which was building bicycles. That was one of them. They had ah. an, another one where they blew bubbles through tubes. Okay. Yes. The goal of the blowing bubbles through tubes was? Team building. Team building. Okay. 
Um, I, I'd like to say that my team building was writing the report and doing the investigation. Huh. Side, side by side, working on computers <laughs> it was a good way. But, but now, now send, send in the clowns. What were the clowns for? The clown was uh, part of a training video, and okay. I guess it was to uh, make the training video a little more interesting. Okay. But the thing about the clowns was in our final report, we like to make the report very factual and objective without bias. And so my rule of thumb was anything that went into a report would have to be um, probative. It would have to be have evidentiary value. And so my rule of thumb is it has to have more probative value than prejudicial value. And I thought that the photo of the clown was more prejudicial than probative. And we had many discussions, and I think my staff was uh, disappointed that I took the clown out of the final report. Uh, so the photo of the clown didn't make it into the final report because there are plenty of other more probative pieces of information to put into the report. Uh, nevertheless, um, Congress requested all sorts of information about the con conference. Uh, the White House, the Obama administration requested information. And so the, you know, the pictures of the clown did go to Congress, went to the White House, and they ended up in the media, uh, along with uh, pictures of the mind reader and various other um, events. And so even though you weren't looking for the cameras, the cameras came looking for you, and even John Stewart yes. came looking for you. He did, and he found me. He found you. Uh, then, I, I declined to go on his show many times, but he did find me nonetheless. And there's, and there's a clip of that show <laughs> yes. that we can, we can do this? Yeah, it's a funny clip. Uh, can we show this now? Email, it, it, he says it's a birthday gift for his wife. Uh, they quote the song, it's, it's your party, we're going to party like you, your party. John Stewart made a joke about Sidney Sandler. The moment everybody was really waiting for, Jeff Neely's sworn testimony, answering every tough question Congress could throw at him. An actual accountability moment is going to be satisfying. But, um, oh. so, um, yeah, John Stewart made a joke about the rapper Fiddy Sant, of course, when I was, I was testifying before the House Oversight Committee and they asked me to read an email and the email had the lyrics of one of the rapper's songs. And so I read it in a straight deadpan and I did not say Fiddy Sant, I said 50 cents. Cent. And <laughs> so he made the half dollar joke that I'm sure you've all heard. And, um, and well, for, so for he, those who haven't, tell, tell us that, that joke. Oh, it, it's, it's, he just said, uh, he, he pretended as if I said half dollar instead of 50, okay. 50, 50 cent. Um, so my thing just fell off. Ah. I hope it's still on again. But um, so the, um, uh, yeah. he uh, actually had a funny clip there. And uh, I think I need let's, assistance here. Let's do a timeout. Um, but uh, okay, masking tape always helps. Uh, so um, anyway, John Stewart uh, uh, had some funny jokes, and uh, you may want to watch it. It's on YouTube. Um, but um, it was an example of. Uh, what I ended up testifying, the person that organized the uh, conference also arranged to have a trip to Saipan where he stopped off and, and engaged in snorkeling at various places. And he took his wife and in email, uh, on the government email account, of course, um, he talked about giving her a birthday gift. And that's where he, he quoted the rapper about the birthday song. And uh, so they stopped off and they had snorkeling and it was all at government expense. And, um, and so uh, his excuse was to visit a federal building um, and he was engaged in a number of other questionable practices. Uh, he eventually pled guilty 
uh, uh, to, and uh, served eight months in, I believe it's eight months in uh, federal correctional institution. So let's see, Margaret Thatcher said the problem with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money to spend. Yes. So this is not socialism in America, but it's general services administration, and that's why we have inspector generals. Indeed, e even though in, we do have the Congress that seems to continue to appropriate money. Uh, but yes, and so we are to guard that money and make sure that it's spent wisely. So uh, for, for students or other people watching this, thinking about law school, uh, you, went to you went to Temple, Yes. graduated after wrestling, and <laughs> then you tried to wrestle with theological issues yes. at Westminster Theological Seminary. And you could have, at that point, uh, been deciding, well, this is, the, this is the calling I have. This is where God wants me. But as it turned out, God wanted you, but no particular churches at that moment wanted you as far as offering a position. That's right. And you also wanted to get experience and other things, so you weren't just knowledgeable about theology, but you'd also be knowledgeable about the way that God works in the world and the rest of us sin in the world. Yes. So then you went to law school. Um, to, for, for students who are, who are watching this or eventually reading the transcript, uh, what advice do you have as far as discerning, especially if they're seniors and they're starting to get worried about where they're going to be, uh, what advice do you have about discerning what their calling may be? Well, I, you know, calling is always a difficult thing. I, I think that you uh, should decide what, what you are interested in and pursue that. I think that calling is not uh, a matter of God divinely laying out a uh, plan. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. And, um, and so it's a difficult thing. I think you do your best at what you have in front of you. And, you know, you can make plans, but make them wisely. Be willing to change your plans. Um, you know, I changed. I went to law school. Um, and, uh, you know, wait for, uh, to see what doors God, God opens up. And to, don't be afraid to go through them. And don't be afraid to um, uh, change your mind or to change directions. And you've gone back and forth between uh, private legal work and yes. government service. So same, same thing there. You don't have to decide at a certain point, well, the rest of my life I'm going to do this. You can, you can go back and forth as yes. you've done? Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, I think uh, you used to tell me I had a bright future behind me. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, no, I've been very fortunate to do a lot of different things in my government career. Well. Yeah, one of these different things. In 2006, you were vice chair of the National Procurement Fraud Task Force, Task Force of the Department of Justice. Uh, what did you do in that position? Well, that, that was a task force of uh, Department of Justice uh, attorneys and inspectors general. And we looked at ways to uh, coordinate our efforts to go after fraud, waste, and abuse, to actually prosecute those who defraud the government, to develop cases against uh, individuals and companies that are taking advantage of government programs. And there was a lot of uh, coordination that needed to be done. Uh, one office may be investigating in a company and it didn't know that another office in the federal government was also investigating the company. Um, a suspension and debarment official may be looking at that company and an inspector general may be looking at that company for the same misconduct. And so a large part of that was uh, deconfliction. Uh, it was uh, coordination. Uh, they, we also put together some legislative proposals to improve the way that law enforcement goes after fraud, waste, and abuse. And uh, you played a role in amending a particular regulation that uh, would require contracts to discuss overpayments and crimes. So again, this this did not get any publicity, as far as I as far no. as I know. But <laughs> but it seems important. I mean, so yes. tell us about yeah. how that how that worked out. Well, I mean that the what we developed as as part of the task force was uh, that we would you know require contractors when they knew of a crime, and they knew of fraud, and they had an actual overpayment, that they had to tell us, that they couldn't just hold on to it, 
um, they had to tell the uh, federal agency and the inspector general that, look, we found out about this fraud, um, and, and here it is, and so that we could take care of it, get it, the money back, that is taxpayer money, and, and return it to um, be used in federal programs and uh, return it to the Treasury. So with that background, whenever you read of a lot of government spending right now, do you tend to think, oh, uh, I wonder if there's fraud involved there? Do you, do you get very, has this made you more suspicious of the government? Uh, well, I mean, there's fraud, you know, I think there's fraud in all the programs generally, but fraud is not something that can easily be measured. Um, you know, I, a lot of people like to say there's 20% fraud in uh, health care and Medicare and Medicaid, but that's a guess. That by its very nature, fraud is hidden. Uh, they don't, uh, people who engaged in fraud don't want to be found out. So there's probably fraud that we'll never find out about. There's fraud that we do find out about, but it's hard to measure what percentage of fraud is in any particular program. I think that what is necessary is to have people looking for that fraud, uh, to root out that fraud, and to catch the people that are engaged th in the fraud, and perhaps deter others from beginning to defraud the government. So how, how swampy is the swamp, in other words? <laughs> it's, it's swampy. It's um, you know, I think overall, in terms of uh, the big picture, uh, the administrative state is growing, and uh, you know, it tends to steamroll uh, enumerated powers and separation of powers. Uh, but I think in, the, in terms of the inspector general world, in terms of law enforcement generally, um, you know, it's, it is an important task to determine whether crimes have been committed, whether fraud has been committed against the government. Um, and to work in that area is uh, in, an honorable profession. Um, and, uh, you know, you can avoid the swamp. You just have to be aware and don't get sucked into any sort of political agenda. And to stay away from political agendas, stay away from overreaches uh, and that sort of thing. And that requires a lot of judgment. And I think in terms of inspectors general, I think that you need people who have judgment more than anything else um, to perform that role well. When my, 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 my wife Susan and I were in Serbia a few years ago, we sat in a cafe with a former senator, a mm -hmm. former Serbian senator, uh, who talked about how just about everyone in the government was, was getting rich in various ways and so forth. And so we asked him, well, are you, are you, did you get rich? And he said, no. And then he just started laughing, laughing, because I asked, why? Why didn't you? He said, because I'm an idiot. <laughs> just, uh, and so is that, is that uh, are there parallels to, to the U.S. government in, in that sense? The, I mean, we do, we do often read about politicians who have uh, amassed uh, a great deal of wealth in mm -hmm. office, mm -hmm. uh, how 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 big should our should our suspicion finders be? That's not a, that's not a very well, a very thoughtful uh, I'm, question, but you know what I'm getting. I, at. I think I know what you mean, and and you know I I'm by nature suspicious, and and especially suspicious of people who may be uh, trying to benefit personally from a government program um, instead of doing what's right for the taxpayers and for the American public. And so I think we should always be suspicious of that. I think that, um, you know, the, there are more regulations now and more um, organizations that are looking at that. So it, I don't know if it's getting better or not, but, um, but we should always be um, suspicious of, of that. Is, is the work of Inspector General somewhat like playing that game called uh, Whack-A-Mole? <laughs> where you hit and something else pops up? Is it, that, is it that is, how you feel? It's, some? A, it's a lot like that. Okay. Um, it, there's always something going on. And, you know, uh, and maybe it's not too surprising. The General Services Administration had 12,000 employees. So in any town, small town, where you have 12,000 people, you have people doing very stupid things and criminal things. Every town has a jail. And so when you get that many people together, 
there's bound to be, you know, uh, people doing improper things. And, what, you know, whether it amounts to criminal activity or not, you know, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so, so too much power, too much money in Washington. And so inevitably there's going to be, there's going to be corruption when you well, have such I was, a... I was asked, you know, why, why, why are there always scandals at GSA? And I told them that, you know, the same answer that the bank robber gave, that's where the money is. The money, yeah. Uh, and a lot of money flows through GSA. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think this fellow, uh, Willie, Willie Sutton. Willie Sutton, Why do you rob it. banks? That's where the money is. Precisely. So, uh, you know, there's a saying about, uh, um, you know, happy is the land that has heroes. And, and you received an award or at least recognition as for heroic action. I suppose... That I mean, that's true. Happy is the land that has heroes, but happier is the land that needs no heroes. Indeed. But Indeed. here we are. Um, then talking about about heroic activity and stopping not just not just theft, but uh, but very serious crime and terrorist crime. Uh, you're known for your contributions in some terrorism prosecutions. Uh, could, you, could you tell us about about a couple of those? I was fortunate to uh, be able to work on some terrorism prosecutions. I worked on the Bissaui case and uh, was involved in uh, uh, aspects of that. I had to leave early to take my position as Inspector General, so I withdraw, drew from that. Uh, but I was fortunate to work on a number of issues uh, involving the Nisawi case, mainly on sealing information and unsealing information. Uh, there was uh, the New York Times wanted to have the tapes of the last words of the firemen in the building uh, all those communications on the radio were, were taped. So there were tapes and transcripts. And so they intervened in the Eastern Dis District of Virginia to get those, and I handled that matter uh, for them, as well as um, a matter in the Fourth Circuit. So your goal there was, was not to let those tapes be broadcast? Well, the, the, pro or? the problem was um, uh, to, we don't want to create an atmosphere where there can be an unfair trial. We want to preserve the fair trial rights of the government and also of the defendant. And if there's a lot of publicity out there, if there's certain pieces of information that will be used at trial and it's uh, being discussed publicly, it, it tends to uh, impinge upon the fair trial rights of mm -hmm. both parties. Uh, and so there is also a congressional uh, request for some of that information as well that uh, that I argued and um, I, I to preserve, and uh, and so we were concerned that um, that fair trial rights might be waived if uh, that information became public. That we wanted to use at trial. Did you win? Uh, partially, okay. partially, and um, in the Fourth Circuit, partially as well. I also uh, defended a magistrate judge in the Fourth Circuit and in district court, uh, where she sealed an affidavit supporting uh, a search uh, of Islamic charities in Northern Virginia. And um, we won in the Fourth Circuit as well. And um, uh, I was fortunate to work on some other uh, terrorism cases as well. I defended the Attorney General uh, along with others um, in the Eastern District of New York when he was sued uh, for detaining individuals on 9-11. And so that all worked out well for the Attorney General. Uh, yeah, tell, tell us more about that case as far as detaining those individuals. What was involved there? Well, a, 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 as you recall, a number of individuals were detained immediately and uh, held for a while, and they brought suit against the government and against the Attorney General, general the Deputy Attorney General, uh, and a number of other DOJ officials. The Department of Justice will represent the Attorney General in his official capacity. He was also sued in his individual personal capacity, and they authorized him to retain outside counsel. He chose uh, to have some assistant U.S. attorneys represent him, and I was one of those assistant U.S. attorneys. So we would uh, go up to the uh, Eastern District of New York. Our home district was the Eastern District of Virginia, here in Alexandria. But we would, on occasion, go up and ar make argue motions up in the uh, Eastern District of New York and we eventually got the case dismissed against the Attorney General. There were actually a number of those cases. 
And again, I ended up withdrawing to go to Senate confirmation as Inspector General. Okay. Um, you were a special counsel on health care fraud yes. with the Deputy Attorney General. Uh, tell us about that. Well, um, as, uh, as an assistant U.S. attorney, I did a lot of fraud cases and looked at health care fraud and brought a number of health care fraud cases against um, uh, companies that were defrauding Medicare, Medicaid. And as the special counsel on health care fraud for the deputy attorney general, I coordinated the efforts of the Department of Justice in uh, looking at health care fraud. So we had the FBI, we had the um, uh, civil division, criminal division, uh, and we worked closely with HHS to develop a strategy for um, finding health care fraud so that we could prosecute it. Uh, and so the, a number of cases that came out of my time as special counsel on health care fraud, one was a, a case against uh, TAP Pharmaceuticals where they were giving kickbacks if doctors were, if they would prescribe a certain um, prescription, they would get kickback from the drug company, for example. And that was fairly early on. So a number of cases developed after that. And there was uh, uh, a, a number of other cases. But uh, I, I can tell you the names of the companies, but I'm, it just dawned on me the companies probably don't want their names out there uh, that we've uh, reached settlements with and um, uh, had uh, successful health care prosecutions. Well, uh for those of us just paying attention to the news now, uh, there are stories that keep coming up about health care fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, in what ways, from your experience, in what ways could we minimize health care fraud? Or, again, is it, is it whack-a-mole where it's always going to come popping up? How do you, how, with, with so many billions of dollars sloshing around, right. how do you reduce the amount of fraud? Well, I mean, that's a very difficult question. Um, I think there's a lot involved in that. Uh, there's always the incentive to maximize your uh, reimbursement from the federal government. Mm -hmm. If you're a health care provider, you want to get paid for the work that you actually did. Uh, we want to make sure that you don't get paid more than what you actually did. And so uh, there's a lot of judgment calls in, in the billing. There are a lot of rules and regulations that sometimes make it very confusing. So there are a lot of mistakes that companies make as well. And so the trick is to, to find, uh, determine when is it a mistake and when is it intentional. You know, if all the mistakes are in the favor of the company, then, you know, maybe there's something else going on. Uh, but there are other ways to determine that sort of uh, issue. Uh, regulations have gotten so complicated that it also presents a problem to, to follow all the regulations in precisely the way that the government has prescribed. So it's a, it's a large, complex problem. So sometimes we debate healthcare questions uh, high up on the, ladder, on the ladder of abstraction. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've actually seen at, at ground level the way this works out. So based on that experience, any advice as we discuss more questions of revising healthcare, changing plans, from your experience of just seeing the, the corruption involved, any advice on what we should do? Make sure the rules are clear and that people understand what the rules are and how to follow them. And then, and then make sure they're followed. Um, Easier I, said than done, though. Correct. What? Easier said than done. Easier said than done. I, I, as I said, it's extremely complex. And as I mentioned in, in the beginning of the program, my views do not necessarily reflect those of the administration. Right, right. Or, but, uh, yeah, the, um, I mean, Congress originally passed Obamacare, apparently, without reading the bill. Why did you have to read it? Uh, does anyone really know how this all works, or is it, is it mysteries wrapped in enigmas? Well, for my time in private practice, um, I was in, worked for a law firm just uh, the, for the last couple of years. The lawyers and law firms all claim that they figured it out and know it, and they can help their clients. But I, I say that facetiously, right. um, but um, it's difficult. I was going to say, I find that hard to believe. It, it, yeah, no, it's um, uh, a very difficult problem. Uh, um, just looking at uh, other aspects of your background, uh, that uh, 
Uh, at one point, a local U.S. attorney's office was disqualified concerning a major oh, right. drug case. Yes. And, and you salvaged it, as far as I understand. Can you tell us that story? Yes. Um, uh, things go wrong in all aspects of government, including law enforcement. So um, they uh, convicted one of the biggest uh, drug dealers in West Virginia, and they got the conviction. It was a big victory. And then it turns out that later on, they find out that the uh, lead detective it was a task force that involved uh, local detectives and DEA agents. Um, so it was a mix of federal and local uh, drug enforcement uh, officials. It turns out that the lead detective was having a sexual relationship with the wife of the drug kingpin that was convicted. And there were a number of irregularities. Um, the um, um, the wife had not passed a polygraph, and somehow the results got lost. The, Some, somehow. Somehow, yes. And, um, and so the assistant U.S. attorney handling it did not know that she had failed the polygraph, and she reached a very favorable uh, resolution of her potential liability, a, a very nice plea deal. Um, then it turns out that some money that was recovered, apparently they... Um, uh, would take the proceeds of drug deals and put them in baggies and bury them in the yard. So they dug up a number of these um, baggies and there was a discrepancy in the amount of money that, uh, that was uh, reported. Uh, so after the uh, conviction and the drug kingpin was sentenced uh, to life imprisonment um, and he went away, the uh, lead detective and the wife broke up and she brought all this to the judge and said that she had received some of that drug money uh, and, and that sort of thing. And so the judge um, wanted to know whether he should set aside the entire conviction and, and the case and disqualify the local U.S. Attorney's Office because they would be witnesses, potential witnesses in the case. And so the Department of Justice asked me to go down and to lead a team of assistant U.S. attorneys from the Eastern District of Virginia to uh, see if we could salvage the conviction of the uh, uh, drug dealer. And uh, so we did. We impaneled a grand jury. We um, uh, heard testimony. We um, talked to individuals. And it turns out that a number of the individuals that were now coming forward had... Um, their affidavits drafted from the drug kingpin in a federal correctional institution. And so we were able to add... Dra drafted from? Yeah, he, he drafted it for them and they signed okay. it and submitted it. And so uh, we were able to add some charges like perjury and um, subordinating per perjury. And uh, some other individuals we were able we charged and they pled guilty to obstructing justice and that sort of thing. But... Uh, so we, we were able to, to save the convictions and to um, uh, actually add some, but we were ready to kind of retry the case. We had brought witnesses in from other places that were suppliers and that sort of thing. Um, and fortunately, we didn't have to do the full-length trial. So he drafted their testimony. I mean, does, yeah, does he, he, was he, he, he... He said, submit this to the judge, uh, you know, say the following say that, uh, you know, the detective did this and, and that because he had, was having an affair. And, so and he knew the legal system. He, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was... He was pretty sharp. He was pretty sharp. Okay. And, um, but um, anyway, we were able to uh, preserve the conviction uh, for the Department of Justice. He didn't get offered fellowships to law school based on... No. Uh, so, okay. So some of these things, things seem like they should be the, uh, the basis for novels. They could be. There are a lot of things in that case that you just can't make up. So have, have, um, have novelists come and anyone come to interview you and get <laughs> plots? I'm not, I'm not, not yet. Not yet. Maybe, not I'll, yet. maybe I'll retire and write books. So. Um, I'll call them fiction. Yeah. Um, just one, one other question on this, and then I want to get to a, a little bit of theology about this. But uh, inspector generals are part of the executive branch of government. Correct. Right? 
but there's something in Congress, things bubbling in Congress now to uh, 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 Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota has, has, has a restructuring idea to move the 73 federal inspectors generals out from under their agencies and into an independent agency that would make it an ex that would become an extension of Congress. Is that a, what, she, what's she, going on there? She floated that idea. Uh, she's not in the Senate anymore. Um, right. But uh, she did float that idea, and I addressed it in an an op-ed that I wrote for the the Hill magazine, um, where I thought that inspectors general were in danger of uh, being used by the Congress, including the Senate, and that bill would actually make that explicit. And inspectors general have to have a degree of independence to do their work. Uh, you can't, um, you, you have to be independent to evaluate someone fairly, eva evaluate conduct fairly. And it's, if you're reporting to the Congress in that fashion, uh, your independence is jeopardized and you're coming in biased. You're looking at whatever the political agenda is for the, the Congress or the Senate and being used basically as a tool for them. And uh, my editorial basically was saying it's a real danger f for inspectors general. They need to be independent of Congress. They can't just accept a request by Congress no. uh, because many of these requests are politically motivated and not motivated by what is the inspector's general jo job, and that is to root out fraud, waste, and abuse. So the inspector general has to have an independent basis to conduct an investigation or an audit, audit. not just the fact that, some, that a senator or a committee made a request. So what's the ideal background for an inspector general? It, seem, it seems very different than a lot of other government positions where there's a desire and sometimes, sometimes for cover-ups. This is uncovering. Uh, who, who becomes an inspector general? I mean, besides, besides you, how do, what's the back, is it the, typically the background is, is law school? Well, I, there are many different backgrounds. Uh, by statute, it, it does require that they have a certain background and it lists the number of professions, um, accounting, financial, um, uh, law, uh, law enforcement. Journalism? Uh, not journalism, sorry. All right. uh, but uh, although you are trying to uncover things, it, at times, although we can talk about the state of journalism in another right. segment. Um, but uh, generally, uh, inspectors general have been auditors and uh, law enforcement. More recently, they've been uh, assist assistant U.S. attorneys and lawyers. Okay. So you're probably unusual among the uh, inspector generals of the past 20 years in, in having I'm told I'm very unusual. In, in having, <laughs> well, I was going to say in being a wrestler uh, to wrestle with these problems, but actually I was going to go in terms of theology. Um, I mean, with your seminary background, uh, are there other inspector generals who have a seminary background? Not that I know of, but you'd be surprised who does have a seminary background. Uh, um, some of the chief compliance officers for major corporations have gone to seminary. Um, and their role is somewhat similar to an inspector general. Uh, but, um, but no, I don't know of anyone quite that has my background. So, you know, the, uh, the University of Texas song where I taught and you went to law school, mm -hmm. you know, the eyes of Texas are upon you. Yes. And I tend to look at that in a theological way, that, that God's always <laughs> watching. Uh, does, that, does that mindset help in, in terms of being an inspector general, that in fact we are not... We are not a government of, of people. Uh, we, we have a special role instituted by God. Yes. And we're going, so just, yeah, how do, you, how do you connect the dots of theology and, and inspector general practice? Well, you know, it's obviously um, that can be the subject of a whole another segment, but, um, you know, it, at the most basic level, we serve the Lord and we want to follow the law. We want to follow what he, he um, prescribes. Um, so we're generally against lying, cheating, and stealing. Um, it's not biblical. It's, uh, you know, um, displeases the Lord. And so we, we do want to please him in everything that we do. And so 
Um, so I think that is a good background. People have to be of good character to uh, uh, be an inspector general, to work in an office of inspector general, inspectors general, uh, that um, you know they have to want to follow the law. I think that mindset helps to you know look at whether or not um, an organization or an individual is actually following the law as it's written. Um, and so I think all that helps. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Well, but. yeah, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the, the, those connections. I'm also curious about, um, you know, for, for students now, uh, uh, people coming out of college, um, you know, you now have a perspective of uh, uh, 40 years of different types of, of activity, employment activity. Uh, you you, you uh, uh, have seen a lot, done a lot. Uh, any, any recommendations for young people? When you look back at, at your career, and again, you're, you're not yet at the, at the promised land of Medicare and so forth, but mm -hmm. not all that far away. Uh, you look back at your career, are there things that you wish you had known, say, 40 years ago that you now know? Are there things you would want to pass on to someone who is just coming out of college or in law school? Any, any wisdom or near wisdom to, to, to suggest? And then we're going to go to questions. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, I obviously there are things that I wished I had learned earlier in my life and... Um, you know, obviously there's a lot to learn from um, being in these jobs. So, um, but I think generally I, I would encourage students to consider uh, public service. Uh, it's difficult in today's environment, but it is rewarding. Uh, it, it, I would also suggest that they consider working in an office of inspector general. It's not well known, but uh, there are some very good careers that you can have in those offices and uh, where you might feel quite comfortable um, working in those, those offices. So. Okay. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, anyone want to ask? Let's see, microphone over here. So thank you so much for the responses so far. Um, I appreciate your time. And um, you know, we've talked about fraud quite a bit. I was thinking also about just wasteful spending. Mm -hmm. You know, in fraud, there's a, a crime committed in um, an individual or a group of individuals benefit, but the taxpayer is hurt. Um, you know, in the drive-by media just loves to share, uh, here's an entire building in Afghanistan built by, by US taxpayer dollars all of the furniture inside of it, all these flat screen TVs, and then it was never occupied, it was never used. And, and then they move on. And then next time it's, uh, you know, we overspent when we bought that fleet of aircraft, or we overspent here, or we overspent there. Maybe it's not an inspector's general, but what office, is, is there a watchdog? Is somebody watching just bad decisions about uh, misuse of taxpayer dollars, where the taxpayer, you know, Mm -hmm. would would want to advocate well I, I think that is what inspectors generals should do they should look for for waste as well as fraud and abuse and uh, you know uh, determining waste can be a little more difficult and a little more costly in terms of resources you don't quite get the return the statistics uh, because you don't get a conviction or a result if you find waste other than to put the money to better use. Um, and so in many ways, waste um, doesn't get the attention that it should. But it is very important and, um, and it's, it's, um, it should be looked at. Of course, one person's waste could be another person's great program. And, and sometimes it's hard to know whether or not uh, this particular use of do taxpayer dollars is a waste. And sometimes it involves policy questions. And um, inspectors general are not policy makers. You know, if the policy is in place, they look to see if the policy is being followed. If the result is 
lots of money being wasted, then an inspector general can point that out. But it's really not the inspector general's job to uh, determine that policy. So um, I, I've been asked when I've testified uh, by one, one chairman, um, she kept asking me about a program and saying, does this make sense to you? And I kept saying, well, this is the policy that you established, the Congress established. Uh, I'm not here to opine on whether it's a good policy or bad policy. That's your job. And so she kept going back and forth. But, you know, on, on, on that one, she didn't have the votes to change the policy. And so she wanted to, I guess, complain about the policy. But I kept reminding her that uh, I, I wasn't a policymaker. But in terms of most waste, as you point out, most waste is obvious, and it doesn't involve these delicate policy decisions, and they sh it should be pointed out. So we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, maybe briefly, you could just explain the difference between a political job in the government and a civil service job, and the advantages and disadvantages of both. Yes. Um, a political appointee is appointed by the president and serves at the pleasure of the president. Um, an inspector general is a political appointee appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. And inspectors general serve at the pleasure of the president, so they don't change when administrations change. Um, they can be removed by the president, but the president has to state the reasons 30 days ahead of time in writing to both houses of Congress. So they don't tend to be changed. Um, in other positions throughout the government, you have political appointees that do change when the administration changes. And, uh, and so there are political appoint appointments that last only that long. They can be shorter. Um, the uh, president can fire a political appointee for almost any reason. Uh, there was a big, uh, you may have heard of the U.S. attorneys firings some time ago. Uh, they were all political appointees. They could all be fired for any reason. Uh, career employees of the federal government are part of the civil service, essentially, and they have protections. They can be fired for cause, but you have to show the cause. You have to make the record and then take action. Usually it takes a long time because they have a period to of time to improve performance and to prove that they actually are functioning and deserve to keep their jobs. So uh, I have been both. Um, I've been a, a career uh, attorney uh, in the Department of Justice uh, for a long time and um, was obviously a political appointee and as Inspector General and I'm currently a political appointee. Okay. Well. Thank you very much for coming. Please join me in, in thanking Brian Miller. Thank you.